So we're continuing here in our series in Ephesians. And uh, last week, we looked at uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And we talked about um, how we, as Christians in the body of Christ, we defer to one another. We, we consider others' uh, interests uh, above our own, that we empty ourselves in deference to one another. And that this is one of the ways that we live out a life that is filled with the Spirit. Earlier in Ephesians chapter 5, um, verse 17, it says, Therefore, don't, or, I'm sorry, verse uh, 18 rather, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. And then there, there is a certain grammatical construction that says, indicates that being filled by the Spirit results in speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, uh, singing and making music, giving thanks, and submitting to one another. These are activities that we get involved in when we are filled with God's Spirit and under the influence of God's Spirit. Now, when it comes to submission, we talked a bit about it last week, and it's worth going back and, and, and watching that if you'd like. Um, but this whole topic of submission is, is really difficult. It's, it's one thing to sort of talk about um, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ and, and kind of deferring to one another and preferring one another's interests. And if we're all kind of doing that for each other, then we all kind of have our, our, our everyone's got each other's backs kind of thing. But there's this other issue of submission that I think is, is a bit tricky. And before we go further into chapter 5 um, and husband and wife relationships and, and that, and children and parents, uh, I want to talk a little bit more about this topic of submission, particularly now in the context that we're living in. Uh, while Jane prayed, we are to submit only to God. God is our principal point of submission. In our submission to God, we have other sort of submissive relationships in our world. And we have submission rela submissive relationships with the government. We have submissive relationships with employers and, and different organizations. Uh, we have different submissive relationships with spiritual authority as well. For instance, I could take myself uh, as an example. Uh, obviously, I have a submissive relationship with the uh, British government, right? I'm, I'm here, I've gotten definite leave to remain, and I have agreed, no, I, I'm going to live here, I'm going to live according to the law, I'm going to pay my taxes, and I'm going to you know, abide by the law, and, and all kinds of different things like that. I also am ordained in the Church of England, and so I have a particular submissive relationship, um, not only to the British government, but to uh, the Bishop of Guildford, um, and to the Church of England and to Her Majesty the Queen, who is head of the Church of England. And even as a, uh, as a born and bred Yankee, I have declared my allegiance to Her Majesty the Queen publicly and legally on at least three different occasions. I've got a submissive relationship with Her Majesty the Queen and the Lord Bishop of Guilford. Uh, and then equally, I've, I've got that that relationship with particularly the bishop and, and the church isn't just an employed relationship, but it's also a, a spiritual uh, relationship where I have sort of placed myself under the spiritual authority of the Bishop of Guilford and, uh, and every year sort of re-up that, uh, that submissive relationship and pledge myself to be submissive to him in all things lawful and moral. I'm not alone in that, actually. If you are here and, and you're a part of the Church of England, you know, uh, worshiping here at St. John the Evangelist, North Homewood, you have similar submissive relationships with all three of those organizations, all three of those bodies. You've got a submissive relationship to the government. And we're, we're seeing that not just worked out and paying your council tax and having you know, your PAYE taken out of your paycheck every month and, and that sort of thing and abiding by the law, but we're finding that in a new and particularly um, potentially invasive way with COVID restrictions, right? and COVID security measures. And some of us really like those things and we're comforted by them. And others of us really balk at that. We don't like that. And, and, and it's kind of like, don't tell me I've got to wear a face mask and don't tell me where I can and can't go and 
stay two meters apart? And why can't I go into the church building whenever I want, however I want, sit wherever I want, just like it was before? Why do I have to do all this stuff? All because, you know, the Tory government tells me I have to? What do they know? Right? Um, equally, you can sit back and say, with, uh, you know, Church of England kind of laws and, and Church of England sort of processes and things like that, and ah, I've got to apply for a faculty to do this and to do that, and we've got to go through all this red tape, and why can only a priest, you know, preside over the Eucharist, and what's that all about, and blah, 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 and there's all kinds of different things that we can kind of get a bit het up about. And it's important for us to have a sort of a biblically informed understanding of submission and obedience. And this is what we see here in Acts chapter 4. In Acts chapter 4, um, we see Peter and John uh, finding themselves under the spiritual authority of the Sanhedrin. Because we remember, at this point in time, Christianity is, a, is not distinct from Judaism. Uh, in fact, uh, the Jewish leadership would have seen the Christians as a bit of a cult within um, Judaism. Uh, and we would see Christianity actually as a movement within Judaism that is true to the Jewish scriptures and true to what the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob revealed in the Old Testament has then revealed in Christ and is moving on in his new covenant in Christ's blood. And the question really comes, like it did for Peter and John, what happens when the authority that we are meant to be submissive to requires us or expects us to conduct ourselves or do something that is contrary to God and what God desires, what God has commanded, what God expects of us? And whether we're talking about spiritual authority or we're in Romans chapter 13 and we're talking about governmental authority, I'll just read that for just a, just a moment because that gets appealed to quite regularly. It's interesting, actually. If you just kind of watch when it is people appeal to Romans chapter 13 and when they don't, let me just read the text and then I'll make that commentary. Romans chapter 13, verse 1, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. And then it carries on. It's funny, when our, when our party is in power, we're like, yeah, yeah, Romans 13, Romans 13. Listen, you don't like it, you lost. You know, you lost... It's a, it's a Tory government, submit to the ruling authority. But by golly, if it would have gone a different way, oh, I, no, 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 I've got a moral obligation actually to reject you know, the, the authority of, of, an op, of a different party than the one I belong to. If, 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 if Corbyn would have won and, and a, there was a labor government, well then, no, I, I've got a moral obligation to, to call them out and to not submit and to not obey and, and that sort of thing. It's funny. Not funny, haha. -ha. Funny, if I'm honest, immature and ridiculous. Um, how quick we are to encourage people to submit to an authority when they agree with us. And how quick we are to excuse and justify rebellion against authority when it's someone or something we disagree with. And too often, whether or not we agree or disagree with that authority is not so much grounded in scriptural truth and obedience to God. It's actually usually just grounded in our own political preferences. Is that right? Yeah, it's a little bit unfair, but maybe it's not. Anyhow, what I want to bring up here is the difference between obedience and submission. Because there are going to be times when the authority instituted by God is not acting and is not ruling, is not leading, is not governing, whether it's political, spiritual, at your workplace, or otherwise. They're not leading in a godly way. They're not leading towards godly things. 
What they're asking, what they're requiring, what they're expecting, what they're commanding of us is something that in our conscience we cannot continue with. Our boss is asking us to kind of fudge the numbers. Our, our manager is asking us to cut corners. Uh, uh, you know, the government is asking us to do something that we think is immoral, ungodly, and our commitment and submission to God principally won't allow us to engage in. So what happens? What happens there? Well, this is what we see with Peter and John. Peter and John are told by the spiritual authority, and the Sanhedrin had a, had a, had a bit of sort of political authority as well. They're told, listen, you cannot continue to preach in the name of Jesus. You can't continue to be preaching that Jesus not only was crucified by us, we all know that, you can't keep on telling people that Jesus then rose from the dead. We're telling people that you guys stole the body, even though, interestingly, none of the disciples, none of the apostles were ever arrested for grave robbing. Isn't that fascinating? That's the story that was going around. The disciples stole the body, duh. And that's actually an idea that still people will assume. But the disciples were never arrested for grave robbing. They're arrested for lots of things, never grave robbing. That's weird. Anyway, they're telling the disciples, you've got to stop preaching in Jesus' name. You've got to stop public, publicly declaring that Jesus rose from the dead. Our story is that you guys stole the body. You've got to cut that out. And Peter just says, listen, you tell us, should we obey God or you? Should we obey God or you? And in that moment, Peter and John decide and, and, and make it clear to the authority that they are going to obey God rather than men. And there are times in our lives where we have to make the decision that we are going to obey God in preference to obeying whatever authority we happen to be under, whether that's you know, in our job, in our home, um, in our church, uh, in our government, or, or, or wherever else we might find ourselves in a sort of a submissive relationship. But here's what's interesting. When we carry on and we keep reading in Acts chapter 5, we find that uh, the disciples continue on to preach. All right, and they continue to go. They continue on publicly declaring Jesus as the Messiah and His resurrection from the dead. All right, verse twenty-seven the, of chapter five. The apostles were brought in and made to appear again before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man Jesus' blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Verse 33, when they heard this, the Sanhedrin, when they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. And then Gamaliel addresses the Sanhedrin. And he basically says, this, we, 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 we don't want to kill these guys. It's, it's not a good idea. Verse 40, his speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Here's what the apostles did. 
They said, we've got to obey God rather than man. However, we are going to submit ourselves to your authority and that flogging. How bizarre. How bizarre. That's not how we, how we think of things. That's not how we, that, that, that wouldn't be our impulse regularly. But this is what happens when we submit to the misuse of power, whether that's governmental, church, family, or employment. When we encounter misuse of power, and we find ourselves saying, I've got to obey God rather than you in this instance. However, I'm still going to be in submission to your authority. It means accepting the mistreatment from that authority. Just like Jesus accepted the mistreatment from the Jews and the Romans in his crucifixion. Why would we do that? Peter, aren't you just encouraging people to remain under abusive authority and allow abusers and abusive powers to continue abusing, just laying down and letting yourself be mowed over? Yes and no. What we do when we submit ourselves to that kind of misuse of authority and misuse of power is expose it. That's one of the things Jesus did when the scripture says he made a spectacle of the powers as he died on the cross. He exposed evil for evil. He exposed abuse of power. He exposed oppression. He exposed injustice. And what Peter and John did here when they accepted the flogging from the Sanhedrin is exposed exposed their misuse and overreach of power. He exposed the way they're grasping at straws, grasping at the, some of the most crass levers of power that we have in order to try and suppress and repress them. And what we find generally in society is the more radically a power has to grasp at its power and impose its power on those that are in, under its submission, the more out of control they actually are. The more unpowerful they are revealed to be. And sometimes we get really nervous when we see political parties, or we see organizations, or we see churches, or we see family members, or we see people grabbing, clenching on to power, holding on, reaching, and trying to demonstrate that power really brashly and really obviously. Isn't that so not like Jesus? who didn't consider his equality with God something to be grasped and held onto and, 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 and beaten over the world with, but let it go, received the abuse of power upon himself to reveal its wickedness and abusiveness and to subvert and overturn it. The worldly way that we use power and leadership and authority is for our own advantage and to, and, and to leverage power in order to impose our will on those who disagree with us. The godly way of using power is to subvert evil and wickedness, to receive evil and wickedness, let it reveal itself in its oppression, and then jujitsu it and conquer it in that way. 
It doesn't mean that we roll over. It doesn't mean that we just lay down and get mowed over. Peter and John stood up and said, no, I'm going to confront this. I'm going to say that this is wickedness. I'm going to say that this is not godly. I'm going to speak to, you know, speaking the truth to power is a popular thing to say, but I'm going to speak this truth to power. You are encouraging, you are promoting something that is contrary to who God is and what God is like. So it's not that they just were wilted lilies, wilted lilies, wilted violets, what's the, I don't even know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that they were limp-spined, quite the opposite. Quite the opposite. And so one of the questions that I think each of us needs to address in our lives, whether we're talking about COVID security or taxes or whatever with the government, is the government asking me or requiring me to do something that is contrary to who God is, contrary to God's will? If I don't have a moral obligation to God to disobey, I need to obey that. I just need to get on with it. I just need to submit to that ruling authority. And that submission needs to look like obe obedience. All right, fine. I'm going to put my mask on. Like, 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 whatever. If the political authority is saying, no, you must do this unjust immoral, ungodly thing. We have a responsibility to God to disobey, and if that lands us in jail or with a financial penalty or something like that, then so be it. Submit to that penalty and allow that penalty to be revealed as the unjust thing that it is the immoral thing that it is. Does that make sense? Same thing in, in, in our employment. If you've got a board of directors or you have a CEO or you have a manager or you have a uh, whatever who, who's expecting you to do something that is contrary to God's will, you have a responsibility to God to disobey and if you get fired, you get fired. If you get fewer shifts, you get fewer shifts. And your dependence is upon God. Say, God, I am worshiping you in my life. I'm worshiping you in my work. And I'm going to trust you to take care of me, not my employer. Because, Lord, you are the giver of my daily bread, not my boss. And actually, if my boss is just asking me to do something tedious and annoying that I don't like and think is inefficient and whatever else, but it's not immoral, it's not contrary to God's law, it's not contrary to right or, or anything else like that, then just get on and do it. Just get on and do it. And the scripture tells us that when we do that, we actually glorify Jesus. And we show to people who have no fear of God how good Jesus is and that his, Jesus' people are a blessing in their life. If you find that in your family, you need to speak the truth about that. This is an injustice. In the, like, like that's, not, that's not okay. Mom, dad, aunt, uncle, older brother, older sister, younger, like whoever's got that. And it doesn't, it's not necessarily age in a family. Isn't that interesting? It's not necessarily to do with age to see who's got the power and the authority in a particular dynamic. But to confront that, to name it, to expose injustice, unrighteousness, within the family and at times reveal it to an external agency and say, this isn't okay in my household. And it needs to change. And if you find that at church, if you find that with me, If I ever 
ask you or expect you or require you to do something that is contrary to the will of God, that is contrary to the word of God, that is immoral or illegal, sweet Moses, don't do it. Expose me. Speak the truth to me. Tell me, just like John and Peter, I can't do that. I've got to obey God, not you. And if I'm engaged in some sort of wicked use of my power, let that be revealed. And reveal it to to the bishop or to the archdeacon or, or whatever because I'm accountable. If it's not me or somebody else in the church with authority who is misusing that, please name it. Name it appropriately. Name it to the right people. Name it in the right way, but name it. Expose it. Wickedness must be revealed for wickedness. And one of the ways we reveal it is by submitting to it in our disobedience so that it will be shown for exactly what it is. It's why Jesus said, if someone forces you to go one mile, go two miles. It's with the Roman soldiers. It's exposing misuse of their power. If someone sues you for your tunic, give them your cloak as well. Expose this person who's suing you for something they have no right to, actually. Don't have time to get into all that. Someone slaps you on the right cheek, turn them the other as well. That's a slap of insult. And it's something that somebody have a just case against another for. Expose the wickedness. One of the ways we submit to God is even by submitting to evil leadership in our disobedience of it to expose it for what it is. And we can only do that with our eyes fixed on Jesus, who did it before us. If you're there on Thursday, he's a shepherd who has walked in front of us, enduring the cross, scorning its shame. Jesus isn't asking us to do anything that he hasn't done himself. So we fix our eyes on him and being energized by his spirit and filled with his spirit, we live our lives as Christians, even in this way. Let's take a time of, of quiet um, as we join in musical worship, preparing our hearts for confession. <laughs>